Back in the 70s, board games and improv theater had a baby, and it was called the role-playing game. These games allowed a generation of kids to live out their dreams of slaying dragons and saving kingdoms, all while sitting in their bedrooms and basements. Today, gaming has moved into the cultural mainstream, and role-playing games are back with a vengeance. Join us now as five of these former kids come out of the basement and onto the internet to experience adventure, mystery, and obscure pop culture references. It's time for Roll for Combat. Hey everyone, welcome to Roll for Combat. I'm your GM and host, Steven Glicker, and in this week's show, the boys finally finish all their leveling, and they are off to Eox to explore the strange undead world. In addition, we have the author of the module itself, Splintered Worlds, Miss Amanda Hammond Kuntz, will be joining us this week and next week. That's right, we got her on two shows. Also this week, I have a little GM PC tip is how to really mess up PC characters for fun and profit. And leading into this GM PC tip, we have one Mr. Rusty Carter, who, as many of you know, something happened to him. Something a long time ago. So, just a small recap. A long, long time ago, about a year ago at this point, Rusty, well, he died. We're just going to say it. He died, and I did some shenanigans to make him live. And the shenanigans maybe, kinda, sorta made him a bit undead. No one really knows. And there's been a lot of allusions to him being undead. And Bob has been toying with this idea and has been sort of talking about it a little bit more and more and more. And... We knew one day this was going to happen. They were going to go to Eox, and it's one thing to sort of pretend you're not kind of undead, you know, like in a small group. But when you're going to a planet of undead where they know who you are, it's going to get kind of hard to hide it. So this is something I've been planning for quite a while. We're finally going to see the big reveal, although it might not be this week of what Rusty is. Dun, dun, dun. That's right. We're going to finally find out what the heck the history of Rusty is. And you're going to find out how he became what he is. And that's going to kind of lead into what I'm talking about this week in my GMPC tip of how you can sort of mess up characters and everyone has fun with the messing ups. Also this week, as I said before, Amanda's on the show. Amanda is awesome. And I was talking to her a lot, and she loved this module, and she loves the characters on Eox. It was actually really hard to get her on the show. I decided to cut this into two episodes. It either could have been one very, very long episode or two episodes, and I I just cut it. I'm sorry about it. I know you guys always want, like, a monster episode, but it just makes a little bit better to have two smaller episodes than like one two hour episode it's just sort of the way it works when i create and cut the episodes so also you get her for two weeks so yay you get her a little bit this week and then you get her some more next week anyhow with that let's jump right into episode and check out what the guys are doing on the way to eox Last we left off, you guys went on your shopping spree, you leveled up to level 6, you got a whole bunch of credits, and then you built a new ship. You got a brand new ship. It's the same ship, except now it's level, or sorry, it's tier 6. And it has all new guns and all new exercise equipment and all new, I don't know, escape pods. It's all brand new. It's all shiny and chrome. So you got your ship... You were told to go to Eox, that hopefully you can find out a bit about the corpse fleet there and maybe get some leads, and that is where you are. What do you guys want to do? Are you guys ready to go off to Eox? 
Let's get, do it. Let's go. Eox. I'd like to borrow some credits. Oh, jeez. Chris Beamer is playing the Lashunta operative, Hiroji. Uh, <clears throat> certainly, that's fine. How much do you want to borrow? Bob Marquis is playing the human envoy, Rusty Carter. 600 credits. Certainly, that's fine. Um, obviously, I am not, you know, a bank in your traditional sense, and I know that you're good for it. And I, of course, unfortunately, my interest rates are a bit higher than you might find on the ones. <laughs> yes, like how much This higher? is a bidding well, situation. I, just it's never. only going to be a 25% interest rate per week. Oh, and, that it? <laughs> you know, after a certain month, of course, there's also going to be an additional surcharge. So... Let's say it's your six hundred dollars that I'm happy to six hundred credits I'm happy to give you. It'll be an additional hundred and fifty credits minimum and hundred and fifty credits per week to pay me back. A hundred and fifty credits is the juice you're saying. That's wow. the that's Well, the that's that's the fee. Then there's hundred and fifty per week after that, the VIG. Wait a minute. Wow. Okay, so how about this? Uh I give you six hundred, you give me eight hundred next time we cash in chips. John Stats is playing the Vesk soldier, Mo Dupinski. That's a little bit better deal. Do you have 600 yeah. to give me? Uh, sure. Yeah, I have 2,300. I like the Vesk's offer. I think I'll take it. Yeah. It's, All it's, right. I mean, that's fine. See, if you had paid me back within a few days, you would have only paid me back 750. So I, I know, yeah. but I may not. So have actually, that he's charging you days. more. Wow. All right. That's, you're Meanwhile, actually getting rough Tuttle, Tuttle shall be a borrower nor a lender be. Right. <laughs> Honest Mo's money lending. Jason McDonald is playing the Yosoki mechanic Tuttle Blacktail and his drone Cheddar. I just I did my math wrong. I I just didn't want to recalculate it. Yeah. So. yeah. Well, and now Mo's charging you more than I would. So I mean, there it is. Yeah, wow. but it might take me a couple weeks to pay yeah, you back. Yeah, it's going to be. I mean, oh, we, it takes us, so you're it takes a, us a week credit. Yeah, it takes oh. us a week to okay. just do nothing. I have a. I like to gamble. Well, I'm sure that's the case. And, and most interest is moving to the combat. Let's go to Eox. We arrive at Eox. Okay. Without incident. Uh, yeah, it doesn't quite <laughs> go like that. You wish. Okay, so first of all, you guys jump on your ship. All right, so the journey to Eox takes about one to six days. So we'll see approximately. How many days is it going to be? All right, we'll four. say four days. While you are fighting over who's the captain for the 853rd time, you get a transmission from Chussex, who says to you, Greetings, my friends. It is a grave matter indeed that the corpse fleet seems so intent on keeping you from following the cult of the devourer's trail, even to the point of attempting to eliminate you. Chessex begins, their antenna folded pensively. I presume that means they are now searching for the stellar degenerator as well. The corpse fleet is not to be trifled with and its schemes perpetually frustrate the Oxians here on Absalon stations. The Oxian delegation diligently reports the efforts their planet undertakes to curb the corpse fleet's activities, but they never seem to make a dent in the threat. Given your run-ins with the corpse fleet of late, I have kept my antennae in the air, my contacts in the Oxian assembly here on the station have worked. With a bureaucrat and historian in Eox's Ministry of Eternal Vigilance named Juanetta Trucks, she is posted in the city of Orphis and handles reports about corpse fleet activity on Eox. According to my contacts, Miss Trucks recently received some indications that the fleet's agents are up to something, perhaps recruiting for a big mission or gathering resources. It's unclear. With following any leads that Miss Trucks has gathered could very well reveal the corpse fleet's plots for the stellar degenerator. And if we're lucky, the coordinates where the cultists from the Star Eater's spine fled to. Winata Trucks' office is located in the district of Orphises called the Splice. I have informed her 
that you'll be arriving soon. I will not misrepresent Eox. It is a dead world and will not be comfortable even for representatives of Starfinder Society on official business. But Eox is a member of the Pack Worlds, so one can expect a certain amount of civilization. Chisix clears their throat with a metallic rasp and continues, I am sure I do not need to remind you, but this mission is of the utmost priority. You must meet Winita Trucks and find the location of this stellar degenerator. You must keep it out of the hands of the corpse fleet and the cult of the devourer. Everything could be at stake and transmission and the transmission ends. What did you say? A stellar what? The stellar degenerator is the super weapon that you believe that this gate will open. I, I think we've just been calling it the death star. Yeah. Well, Whoever they are, they're gonna they're gonna get they're gonna get trifled with. Proper. Uh no, I think that we actually need to harness that power and use it on the cause of goodness and right. Yes. Think of Well, power. I mean it consider it like a ship of which I'm the captain. I would consider that ideal. Mm. Excellent. There we go. So you can ask questions to Chisex. However, the transmission time um, is approximately one to five hours because of, you know, fluctuations in the drift. But you can send questions and then wait, you know, half a day for the answer to come back if you have any. You can also do any research because you do have four days. Uh, okay, can, can I just simply go to Space Google for this time being and actually just look up Corpse Fleet? Do we know anything about their leaders, their member, their actual current organization that's not not from 50 years ago, 100 years ago? Sure. You can give me... What's your culture plus 20? Well, I asked for space Google. All right. right. So you it's want us to do... You want us, okay. You want me to do a roll. All right. That's No, no, no. It's my, take 20. That's my knowledge. All right. Hold no, on. No, 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 no. Are you listening? Can you hear me? Is, is my mic working? I'm it's working. You. I can hear you. Okay, I'm just making sure. It's a take 20. That's all it is. So it's not... All right. Uh, culture 5. So take 20, 25. 25. You know that the Corpse Fleet is an exiled offshoot of the Eoxian Navy that's made up of powerful admirals and captains who roam the universe in starship formed, forged from bone and steel. Officially, the government of EX condemns this rogue organization... The Corpse Fleet formed when a powerful and disgruntled members of the Oxian Navy could not stomach the world's adoption of the Absalon Pact. These naval officers deeply believed in the same sort of Eoxian superiority that once led the planet to destroy civilizations that refused to acknowledge Eox's power, including the worlds known as the Twins, the shattered remnants of which now form the Despera. Yeah, the, the, the asteroid belt that you guys... Right, right. Have. Yeah. That's all you know. It's a rogue organization that doesn't really have any information. There's no hierarchy. There's just... It's like looking up, I don't know, information about a super secret terrorist organization in the Middle East. That's how much you would find out. Uh, broke away one year ago, five years ago, ten years ago. When they signed the Pack Worlds Accords, okay. which was... Whenever that date is. Okay. Yeah, hundreds of years ago. So they've been out there for great. a while. Now, remember, they're undead. So great. No, that's good. Anything. That's great. So we're going to meet uh, Trucks. Is that uh, the plan? Yeah, you, Trucks is the official representative uh, for Eox, who looks into reports of basically people who, you know, might be. That's a good name, Winetta. Winetta Trucks. Yeah, Winetta Trucks. Is that a she? Is that a female? Yes. It's. Uh, do you have a, do you actually, do you want to ask uh, Chisex about this? Uh, sure. Yeah. Tell us about this Winetta Trucks. So you send that off, and then that goes. So six hours later, you get a response. And you see Chisix and says to you, Ah, yes, Winata 
is a ghoul, Chisick says. But she was once a human and a resident of Absalon Station. Her relatively recent transition to undeath makes her slightly more accommodating to the Starfinder Society than most Eoxians. Apparently, in life, Winetta was obsessed with the Eoxian history and the cataclysm that promoted most of the planet's population to turn to undeath. Winetta became intent on achieving immortality with the Oxian's help. She succeeded, but she spent all of her wealth in the process and treatments required to achieve her transformation into a ghoul. Given her knowledge of Eoxian culture and history, she then sought work with the planet's government. It was Ambassador Grevelis Gnor himself who offered Winetta a position at the Ministry of Eternal Vigilance. Okay. A ghoul, huh? Yeah, Ooh. and then she sends uh, he sends a picture of what she looks like. Oh, cool. It's been a while since we've had a picture. Well, at least she was human. That's all I really wanted to know. And that's what she looks like now. Not bad. Not bad. She's got uh, definitely ghoul. Very ghoulish. Actually, it looks like yeah. It looks like I, Eddie. <laughs> it looks. She looks like a monster. Yeah. I, I might. I might have some hair products I could loan her. Well, it's. I'm sure she's happy the way yeah. she is. Like, so what she, do ghouls eat? Yeah. Well, Hopefully not Yusoki. Carry on. Oh, they. Uh, Soylent green, Soylent red, Soylent purple, you know, standards. So now she's a historian. Um, are we, should we be concerned that this, this adventure is getting a little bit academic? I mean, I love it. I'm quite content for it to become more academic. I'm a student. I'm actually well, enrolled in university well, currently. Oh. Uh, actually, I think I might have an honorary uh, degree. From that university, I don't recall. Oh, jeez. Okay, that answers my question. We have some eggheads, yes. Well, we have one egghead, and we have some uh, posers. <laughs> <laughs> that's a true egghead would say that. All right. Uh, so, uh, yes, that's right, Doctor Tuttle. You know, those other two are kind of posers. So her her focus in uh, history remind me again is how is that relevant? Like, what? what is her focus? Um, I don't know. Do you have any questions you should ask, Mr. Well, that's Chisholm. what I'm asking. Yeah, that's oh, what I'm Oh, you're going to ask Tristan? Yeah. Oh, oh, yeah. Okay. Like, while, while he's... Very good. So uh, I want to ask him, like, what's her, uh, okay. what's her speciality? All right. Eight hours go by um, as you ask your questions, and then you come back. He, or sorry, it says back to you, Miss Trucks is the director and the only full-time employee of the Ministry of Eternal Vigilance. All reports of the corpse fleet activity on EOX cross her desk, at least officially, and her office keeps files on every reported incident. Unfortunately, there are also reports of Eoxian citizens who provide real information about the corpse fleet being intimidated or even attacked by corpse fleet sympathizers who believe Librians should not betray their own kind. This surely does not make Winetta's job any easier, given the supposed ambivalence that many Yoxiums exhibit towards the corpse fleet. It is perhaps no surprise that Ambassador Nor installed a non Librian in this post. A human ghoul would most likely be less intimidating than a powerful necrovite, and thus more likely to receive reports from citizens. In addition, a former human would have no sympathy for the corpse fleet, as an Librian or other native Eoxian might. The last impression Ambassador Noor wants to give the Pack Worlds is that Eox is not taking the corpse fleet threat seriously. As for her background, the Ministry of Eternal Vigilance is a bureaucratic branch of the Oxian government, though a very small branch. In fact, she's the only full-time employee. However, Eoxian law requires citizens to report all corpse fleet activity they witness or suspect. The Ministry takes these reports and provides copies to interested parties as necessary. 
law enforcement agencies, the Oxian Assembly on Absalon Station, who are the stewards. In fact, Eox's ambassadors and government officials make a dutiful show of regularly handing over all of the ministry's reports to the stewards. It's very important that the Pack Worlds know the Eoxians are making every possible effort to disavow and eliminate the corpse fleet. It's very thorough system designed to ease the fears of other Pack Worlds member and help Eox avoid blame for the corpse fleet. Oh, oh, of course, this practice, the system is not so smooth. The Oxians file precious few reports about the corpse fleet, given the planet's population. Some say there are a significant number of corpse fleet synthesizers amongst the residents of Eoxian necropolises, as well as among the bone sages who rule the planet. As for Miss Trux herself, she was a historian of Eox and all aspects of Eox society. Hence, it was felt that she would fit into this role quite well. All yeah, right. that's interesting. It doesn't right? sound like they take the corpse fleet that seriously. It well, like assign, uh, assigning a single person in some basement office to catalog reports. Yeah, I know. Exactly, seem like taking it seriously. It sounds like they are, uh, in some ways, maybe sympathetic to the cause. That makes me nervous. I disagree with you all. They put a human in charge of this entire matter, so obviously they were taking it as seriously as possible. Well, a ghoul. Well, a recent well, human. Right. There's no reason to be... I understand uh, the motivations to put that person, put her in that position, but yeah, it sounds a little shady. We should walk around with a flag saying, down with the corpse fleet and see what happens. Like everywhere Ooh, we go that's on a good, the axis, yeah, that's walk around with a good, flag. Uh, <laughs> yeah, like a big cape on the back. Yeah. yeah. Yeah, and you know what? We could disguise ourselves as like corpses. Like I could... They would uh, love that. Put a mask on. Yeah, I they mean, would like they would like that. All right, so I think we have a plan. All right, so we we're, we're going to march around. Uh, well, we should talk to her first. Yeah. Well, we're on our way, right? So. Yeah. So, uh, it's time to. Uh, do you guys have any questions? Because I have a feeling that um, we're not going to get an answer for a certain number of hours. Well, you have three more days till you're going to yeah. be there. Yeah. Uh, if you have any more questions, now is the time. You could also do some space Google research on EOX. There's a lot of information on EOX. There's tons of information on EOX. No, as long as we know where to go to our office, I think that's pretty much what we need to know. Unless you guys have your highfalutin ideas. You want to research well, like a they bunch had, of uh, nerds. <laughs> they, I guess there was a cataclysmic event where they all got turned into undead, or they did it on purpose. or What's the story with that? Oh, okay. That you could probably get on. Yeah, that is, uh, that's easily, you can look that up. There's tons of information, but basically is, you know, you look it up and it tells you, you know, Eox is amongst the most mysterious of the pack worlds. And it's obviously the member that everyone kind of fears, even though no one really talks about it since it is a world of undead and humans and sorry, <clears throat> living are you know they can go and visit but there's really only one city that's designed for humans that actually has an atmosphere and that's where you're going that area actually is domed where you can actually go outside and breathe otherwise the rest of the planet is just vacuum really? and yeah it's just oh, they don't care planets. do they they can yeah. they can, they can walk dead. around in the vacuum yeah yeah Aww. they're undead Oh. They, they don't need to breathe. Oh man! All so right. there's like not because of the you know because of the um, because of the gap, you know there's not a lot of information. But you know what they know is that it was once a beautiful planet with an ecosystem capable of sustaining life, but now it has a thin, poisonous atmosphere covered with radiation. Mm -hmm. There's very little about the planet's history that survived. All they know is that there was some gigantic war of some sort that probably just blew up pretty much the world. There's a crater several thousand miles long that appears to have been created during this war. And somehow during that war, 
that all the citizens turn themselves undead so they can continue living on this planet because back then they might not have had the technology to actually escape. So instead they used magic to just make themselves all live on now this dead world. Hmm. There's no, like, there used to be, you know, oceans, those are gone. It, it just goes on and on. And then even more fascinating is some of the poor life that used to be on the planet before the war has now mutated into horrific creatures. Oh, great. Horrific undead creatures. Oh, just horrific, horrific. We'll, we'll be inside all the time, so that, that won't bother us, will it? No, you'll be fine. Thank Don't worry you. about okay, it. Okay, good. Yeah, no, no, you'll never uh, encounter all anything right. like that. Yeah, there's like, it's it's. Oh, are we gonna say it? Are we gonna say it? It's an ugly planet. Although it's not a bug planet, it's a dead planet. Yeah. All right. Well, the, si- the scientist in Tuttle is kind of curious, but the rest of him just wants to stay on the ship the whole time. Yeah, it makes me nervous. Undead. Not Mo, Mo's not nervous. We're just going to be inside. It'll be fine. It's a packed world. They're going to give us escorts. It's kind of like we're going to North Korea. Kind I'm of. sleeping. I'm sleeping with not a, a thought in my head. So with that, uh, uh, I am a little concerned about all that radiation because those of us among the living could be hurt by that radiation. I'm very concerned about that. Nope, not concerned here. Okay, I won't uh, won't be concerned then. Yeah, where you're going is actually pretty large. Let's take a look. Yeah, the place you're going is Necropolis. It has about <laughs> 1.5 million people, and it's the oldest, most prosperous of Eox's few cities. And this is where ambassadors go, other Pack Worlds members. This is like pretty much anywhere from the Pack Worlds goes to here. It's all enclosed within a bubble bubble of breathable atmosphere, making it one of the most common destinations for living visitors outside the lifeline. Um, it's also right near the planetary capital, so you know it's it's a bustling area. This uh, city does do some to accommodate living residents, but you know you guys are eh. Not great. Third or fourth class citizens, so you'll get what you get, and you won't complain. We'll they turn the they turn the radiation down to like a three or something. Exactly, exactly. It's uh, it's sort of livable, you know, if you call it living. Yeah. Do you have any other questions uh, for Chisex? Otherwise, Hiroji can continue his studious academic research of that three year degree he's trying nerd, to get. Nerd, nerd. Yep. Well, I, have, I have a 14 intelligence, you know. Wow. Uh-huh. Wow. Mm-hmm. Mr. Tuttle, what's your intelligence? Uh, it is somewhat high. Oh, it's one of those, like, if you got to ask, then you don't yeah. need to know. No, those who have it don't brag. That's the thing. Oh, that's right. That would, he, actually, that would actually be a 19. Mo has it. Woohoo! 19. Mm-hmm. Guess he is bragging a little. I was thinking about getting the uh, like the level two uh, skill upgrade too, but I decided that would be that'd be like half my money, so I decided to go wait off on that for a little longer. Hmm. <sighs> level two is nice. I recommend it if you have the means. <laughs> if you have the means, I recommend it. It is so choice. Oh, I'll do it at some point. I just <laughs> didn't feel like doing it this particular shopping. Yeah, I, I'm yeah. I'm in the negatives in terms of means. So well. With that, Chisix clears his throat and says, Oh, by the way, I was able to round up some additional funds for the efforts at the Star Eater's Spine. I was able to get another 500 credits each, which I have transferred to your recep- your uh, accounts, your bank accounts. Bank. Mm-hmm. In addition, I promise a similar reward if your mission to Eox is successful. Another 500 credits. Going right to the mask. Touching. Well, no, you were, you were given 2,500. You were given 2,000 each, if you remember. And now this is another 500. So you've got a yeah. 2,500 for the work you did in the asteroid. So you can pay off the VIG, and you can pay off some of the uh, the actual capital. Principal. Yeah, we don't need it now. We don't need it now. That's right. 
I know. I don't like being in debt. They should have like I should be able to have a credit card though. That is an interesting point. Pathfinder Society credit card. Yeah, credit uh, in this modern world would be a wonderful thing. Well, maybe they've developed an economy where credit is actually a, a bad thing. I mean, it's like Starfleet. You know, you, all that's you, you, gone, man. Yeah, you yeah. Don't need, you mean, don't need well, Starfleet like this old. Money there seems to be a lot of credit. Yeah, they got rid of money at all entirely. That's different. Although there is gold pressed latinum around for certain people. <laughs> Well, oh, then think of it this okay. way. You're not actually using credits. It's gold press latinum. Would you like a oh, slip that. or would you like a strip or bar? Strip or bar. That was right. <laughs> I forgot the terminology. I would like a, I would like bars, plural. So now, Hiroji, how much did you borrow? 600? You can almost pay that off. Almost. Not quite. No. Not quite. Uh, yeah. What's 600? What's six hundred? No, I owe eight hundred. Six hundred is nothing. No, yeah. you owe eight hundred. Oh, yeah, you, yeah. You got you got a while to go, buddy. You might you might want to shake some people down or something. Well, I mean, if something happens to Mo, I guess it's true. Know. There's a little. Uh, there's a possibility could, be, could turn your, turn in your favor. Yep. Well, Hiroshi, I want you to start humming. Uh, I sold my soul to the company store. And... <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Okay. So after a couple of days, you pop out of the drift and you get to Eox. Eox is a dead world with no seas or oceans. And what's left of its thin atmosphere is toxic, radioactive, both or worse. As you approach the planet, you are contacted by Eoxian space defense officials on the ancient orbital defense platform called the Sentinel, who request identifications and to know your destination. Mo says, hey, Big Daddy here. Yo, it's Mo Dupinski. They seem <laughs> we, confused. They're like, uh, destination? We are our members of the Pathfinder Society on Pathfinder Business. Destination is the Ministry of Eternal Vigilance. Mm, let me look this up. You hear some beeps and boops, and it's like, oh, uh, yes, I see here. You're going to the necropolis city of Orphis. Yes, go to the small spaceport there and land your ship. You are cleared. Thank you. Over and out. Okay. While you make your approach, you actually find out a little bit of information about the splice, the place you are going. The Splice is one of the city's most unappetizing districts. Largely industrial and utilitarian, the Splice is home to several necograph factories, which uh -huh. lay the unpleasant reality of this technology's fabrication bare. These factories are large, dirty, and unsightly. Most of the fusion of undead flesh and technology required to craft necrographs takes place inside the factories but a rather morbid process that also happen on these factories open air grounds this includes the cultivation of massive amounts of vat grown genetically synthesized living flesh as well as the transportation of this unpleasant crop via flesh elevators up into the factories Beyond the necograph factories, the place also is home to rows of slum-like abodes where some of the poorest and politically disfranchised citizens live, including those few living species who have agreed to work for the Eoxians, often the nearby ne necograph factories, in exchange for the gift of undeath once their mortal forms have weakened. Of course, where there's populations, there's also businesses to serve the residents, and the splice is no different. You read about how local law enforcement rarely turns its attention towards the hard scrabble district. So many of the splice's businesses are shady, even by Eoxian standards. Mm. Visitors are very uncommon in the splice, and amenities for the living are scarce enough to be nearly non existent. So bring, bring your own lunch, I guess. Yeah. Anyhow, a few things for you to 
keep in mind as you get this information, as you are walking through customs and you're getting the watchful eye sockets of undead officials, quote, looking at you, unquote, it says to keep in mind that the Yoxian's local day is as long as 30 pack standard days or 720 pack standard hours. However, like the rest of the pack worlds, Eox defaults to a 24-hour pack standard day, which makes timekeeping easy and universal. Also, just keep in mind that it has a 15-day long night, which means darkness or dim light everywhere that doesn't have artificial illumination. Wow, that's grim. Yep. It's a vampire paradise. Yep. Do we have to walk around with our spacesuits in this? Because the, to- the air is toxic. Where you are, no. no. Yeah, we're inside. We don't need our spacesuits. We don't need anything. We're protected. Yeah, where you are now is part of the dome. So you guys are totally fine. You guys, where you're going in, breathable atmosphere. You see a couple of other Pack World members here and there. And you also learn that one year on Eox is the equivalent of 15 Pack years by the way so wow eternal a night yeah this yeah, place, basically this place makes night. me nervous well, don't worry you, you'll be fine you'll be fine it's lawless that i like yeah you go through customs everything is fine let's see i have nothing to declare in customs so you guys land on eox you go through customs you end up in the splice and we have a special guest today. We have the actual author of Splintered World, Amanda Hammond Coots, the go. managing developer for Starfinder from Paizo, who is going to help me GM tonight because there's some goofy NPCs that I know we talked about at Gen Con that she really, really liked. So I wanted to give her the opportunity to actually play them. Hello, Amanda. Hi there. Thanks for having me on, you guys. Hey, well, thanks welcome. for joining us. Yeah, welcome. Yeah. We are very excited. We'll jump right into this. So you guys land on Eox, and sure enough, as you walk through this area, which looks, you know, what I described before, it's, uh, it's a beautiful, beautiful area filled with horrible chemicals and the smell of burning flesh from the flesh Ugh. factories above you, and, Ugh. you know, it's... It's like an undead world would have been bad enough, but this is the slums of the undead world. So you get to go to nothing but the finest establishments. Well, Mo is going to walk on the sidewalk, first of all. He's not going to be in the streets like that unless the sidewalk is more disgusting. And then he's going to uh, say, we should uh, check out some of these buildings. Well, in front of you, you see... The Ministry of Eternal Vigilance, as you were told, oh. instruct to go there. Oh, yeah. And you see a wide two-story building of black and rust-draped gray. It stands out from the other dilapidated structures on this densely packed block. A holographic banner above the sliding double entry displays the words, Ministry of Eternal Vigilance, in common, Anioxian. A smaller sign on the front door declares that this office is open for at least 12 hours every pack standard day, even if the stench from the nearby necrograph factory and the building's lack of windows and architectural accoutrements are less than inviting. Well, we're, we're expected, so most... And it's kinda... dark, right? Or are we in the dark oh, phase right now? Yeah. What time it's of day like, is it? It's eternal night. We'll huh. call it at that. Ah, well, it's great. the 15 days of night. Lovely. All right. Uh, all right. Well, like Alaska or... North we're, Pole. We're expected, right? Yeah. Yes. So, well, when it attracts us, knock, most going right, right in. Else. I actually take a close look at Rusty and say, "How, how do you like this place? You feel like oh, this? it's it's not very pleasant at all. Yeah. I would totally clean it up." And I look at your face. I'm saying this, and the smell is bad. Do you <laughs> think so? Yeah, I think so. I'm just wondering. Right. About yes, you. yes. The smell is awful. I just can't stand it. That's what I was going to say. It's just terrible. I'm kind of wishing they'd like mix in some pastels into their palette or something, uh, lighten the whole place up. Yeah, I agree. Well, that's her. Yes, that's you swing I... through the double doors, and Winnetta trucks. The, 
Yes, there is a lobby. It appears to be a large waiting room with rows of dusty and, in some case, lopsided hover chairs. A tall boxing machine in the corner seems to dispense numbered tokens. Besides the machine, projected on a hologram in the wall are instructions for reporting corpse fleet activity in the ministry. There's a wide front desk with a teller-like window that faces the lobby on one end with a holographic number display behind the front desk. Stairs lead to a second floor, although they are roped off with industrial-grade silver tape labeled No Public Access. You also see a human waiting in the lobby and looks up to you and just nods. Hmm. That's highly unusual, right? Uh, human or was human. Human, as in the same thing as you, Rusty. Completely yes, human. Yes, exactly. Well, totally human then. Good. Uh, Mo says he's going to handle this. Hi there. We're from out of town. Okay. I immediately move forward. <laughs> and say, I I'm sorry. I hope this Vesk isn't bothering you. He's a mere servant. Uh, it's a pleasure to meet you. We're here to see Winota Trex, if you know if she's available by any chance. Hi, my name's Rusty, and it's wonderful to see a compatriot. Here, let me roll diplomacy. She'd move over to him, too, probably. So that is Sean. Amanda, do you want to do Sean, too? Sure. Okay, you can you can do Sean however you wish. Only a diplomacy of 21. I, uh, uh, hi. Uh, good to see you, I, I, I suppose. Well, it's always nice to see a fellow human in these far-off, non-human places, right? <laughs> Are you, uh... You, you doing like me? You looking to you looking to become a ghoul? I uh, I got a line on the on a good uh, supply if you want. Wow! Oh, you're uh, so I, you're transitioning. I I totally respect that. I think that's great. <laughs> when I hear that, I laugh because I'm like, yeah, Rusty's kind of already a ghoul. Yeah. Well, it's not so much uh, transitioning as it is, you know, working, working, working toward the transformation, so to speak. The flesh worn factories. Uh, that's that's quite the job there. Take you about 15 years, give or take? Oh, you're going the factory route. You don't have any connections in high places. Oh, I'm really sorry to, to say that. Well, look, I, I think we're going to get to know a few of the uppers here. If I could put in a good word for you, I'm certainly going to. Yeah, I mean, the whole the whole reason I'm here is I got this guy who's bothering me. He uh, He's my co-worker, and he's just the worst. I think he's a corpse fleet. Uh, I think he's one of them their corpse fleet members. I'm here to report him. They don't take kindly to that here on this planet. My goodness, that sounds serious. You know, I'm actually, as I said, connected. So if you tell me, I could certainly pass that information along as well as whoever else you tell me tell me here. Yeah, yeah, you know, fellow human and all of that. Is, uh, you'll, you'll get it. He's a half-elf. He, he's real shady. He's got beady little eyes. His name is Voxel. He's sort of the worst. He smells bad. He makes fun of my jumpsuit. He makes fun of my hair. He thinks that I'm stupid for spending all of this time trying to become a ghoul. He's a corpse fleet member, he makes I tell fun of your. He makes fun of your hair? What kind he of an animal? He makes fun of everything! I want to roll a culture check to decide whether this person's hair actually is funny or not. <laughs> oh, there's a picture. That's your answer. Looks just great. Don't you worry about that. The scar. My mom said that the scar was uh, fashionable. Yeah. Voxel just says it looks stupid. He's a jerk. Well, well, he sounds like a jerk. That's And you're saying he's working at the factory right across the way? Oh, yeah, he's got to be some kind of... I mean, he is, I'm sure. I'm certain that he's a corpse fleet sympathizer. Why else would I be here to file a report, right? Oh. Totally makes sense. I, I do want to ask, has he ever shown you any kind of badge that looks like this? And I actually show the corpse fleet badge. Yeah, yeah, just like that. I'll tell him, just like that. Let me see that a little bit closely. <laughs> I can describe it now. Okay, now I have to sense motive. Uh, 32 sense motive on our dear friend. Boy, that's good. You can sense that uh, he has no idea what he's talking about. Um, he's just sort <laughs> of, uh, he's just sort of like, he's just excited, you know, that someone's corroborating the story with him. But um, he believes that he saw it. <laughs> <laughs> Goddamn humans. Right, sorry, I mumble out under my breath. All right. Uh, well, uh, well, it's it's been a pleasure talking to you. I, I really appreciate it. Um, now, I got. Let me give you my my personal com. You know, uh, number. If you get any more information, you make sure to immediately send that to me in a, a private message. Oh, oh, sure, of course. Again, Voxel, the worst, the absolute worst. 
totally a member of the corpse fleet. Oh, we're gonna look into him. Don't you worry about that. And remember, my name and my name is Bill. Bill Token. So you just send the message to that name. Nah. Okay, Bill. Appreciate your time, buddy. Not a problem. Anything for a fella. It's a twenty-six bluff. Twenty-six bluff. Not my best. Sure. Well, we have business <laughs> with Winetta Trucks. Yes. Well, yeah. Sean, um, as he's talking to you, suddenly gets called, and you hear number eighty-three, and he's like, "Oh, that's my number!" And then he gets up and goes over to the window. Better get to work. Oh, I suppose we should go look at the machine that dispenses tokens. Oh yeah. Yeah. We have to take it. a number like a deli. Yeah. No. I don't know about yep. that. Uh, Just like right. a deli. Is this could be like Beetlejuice where we get number one million. It could be. Oh, What's the number? What's the number? All right, let's go to the... I mean, I assume we would know how these machines work or whatever. Mo's battling his impatience right now. Sure. You go to the machine, and it's like number 283. And what number did they just call? 83. Oh. Can I do a computers or engineering check to try to get a better number? Sure. Nice. Of course. <laughs> Hack it. Get 84. I assess Tuttle is impatient and te- technologically minded, so a dangerous combination. I can assist you with that. I assist your computer roll. I do too automatically. 29. Oh I'm not sure that will be necessary. Yes. Plus, you're using your new um, augment where you my can do it. Like, jack, yeah. Right. The data jack. So you get a, you just sort of like, you sort of uh, do that, and then a new number comes out. And uh, what was it? 84 comes out. At least I hope the real nice. 84 doesn't show up. But whatever. Well, we're in, like, we're in a pretty much empty room, right? except for these. Like this one guy. Uh, <laughs> is it an empty room? Or there yeah. bunch? Okay. Yeah, it's completely empty. Yeah, because Mo can, then he can uh, intimidate people, accusing them of stealing our number. That's, that's true. There's likely to be one person as opposed to, well, four and a half of us. I do want to sort of hang over here and maybe eavesdrop. Yeah, well, this guy probably won't take a lot of time, so I can wait for one guy. Uh, and Jason, while I'm happy to assist any diplomacy or anything else you do, I think we're about to meet a, an actual academic professor, and I think you're going to be up for her. Tuttle, get in there. So you listen to Sean's story, and Sean's story is pretty much exactly what you just heard, with perhaps even more embellishments. And Miss Trucks is just diligently, boringly taking notes. After a couple of minutes, she dismisses him. He leaves. He sort of gives you a nod. It's like, see you later, Bill. Walks on off. And then uh, Miss Trucks is just taking her notes and writing and typing out a few things and completely ignoring you guys. <clears throat> she, she just continues to ignore you. Yeah, I make loud scraping noises with the chair and stuff. <laughs> Mel- Mo bellows out, excuse me. Hey everyone, Steve here. So there we go. We got Amanda on the show. Yay! She is great. She just like rolls with everything. I really wish I could have had her on the show a lot longer. She is really, really, really busy doing a lot of stuff with Starfinder. It was very hard to even get her on the show for an hour. You would think just an hour of her time wouldn't be too bad, but she has been just nuts. And there's a lot going on right now that I'm aware of, and probably a million things that I'm not aware of. So anyhow, she does come back with us next week. She's going to continue role-playing the NPCs on EOX, including one Miss Trucks, which is one of her favorite characters of all time. So do check that out. I didn't want to kind of start it because the Trucks part is really long. And yeah, I did tease we were going to find out what's going on with Rusty, but I promise you next week... The big reveal, everyone's going to find out once and for all what the heck Rusty is and whether or not he's truly undead or something else happened to him. You're going to find out all that next week, I promise. As for my GMPC tip, how to mess up your PCs for fun and profit. So I've actually kind of talked about this a little bit in the past. But it's fun to talk about anyhow, so I'll talk about it again. And it just came up. So here's an example of 
how to mess up your PCs. Now, I've, I've said this before, is that one thing I like to do is I don't like to actually kill off PCs. I find it much more interesting is that rather than having them die, to have them get horribly scarred or mutilated or mutated in such a way and that they come back. So you can do that a number of ways. You can do that by having a god intervene and put them on a quest. I've actually done that one a lot. That one's really easy to work out because almost everyone has a god they worship and gods are a known entity in most of these universes. So them dying and meeting their god and then getting put on a quest of some sort really isn't, you know, like too jar you know, too jarring. That's something you'll be like, oh yeah, okay, that makes sense. Uh, something they often will do is that after they go on the quest is that they're messed up in some way, that some of their stats are changed or their abilities changed or they gain some new class features or lose some class features it has to be permanent so that there's a delineation between their character before and after they died it works out really really well and you'll see that actually in professional writing and fantasy writing they do that all the time probably the most famous one of all is Gandalf the Grey turning into Gandalf the White you know that's one of the most famous ones but you know something similar along those lines think of that way that one he actually leveled up he died and then became more powerful. So normally I usually don't make them more powerful when they die. Sort of make them go sideways powerful. Anyhow, one thing I like to do, and it's also indirectly, either when they die, I sort of change them, which is fun. And again, always get the PC's permission. I always talk to them about it ahead of time. I don't tell them exactly how they changed. But Bob has run with it. I'm going to tell you that much. That Bob, I started him off kind of like getting tattoos. I don't know those of you out there who get tattoos. It's usually you start off with one. And before you know it, they're so addictive you have like 30. Same thing. I kind of made his character a little messed up. And before you know it, Bob has just been messing him up at every single time. He has an opportunity. He is making him go full nasty undead and then some. You will see. The other one that also kind of became different, not by me indirectly, I'm not going to take any credit for it, but Tuttle, believe it or not, Tuttle has sort of morphed and changed, I think, from his original thinking. It's originally, I think, Tuttle was going to be all science and academics. And before you know it, he has mysticism. He now has suckers on his feet. He has implants in his head. He's riding cheddar. And this is not something that I did directly, but I have definitely been talking to Jason about it. And I think you know, making him comfortable for the idea. I know the um, the implant in his head for the plus one computers, he and I definitely, I was the one who brought it up, and he, I mean, he looked at everything. I'm not going to, again, take any credit for it, but he and I definitely talk about it, and I do encourage him to sort of go in a different direction. And if you see Tuttle from the beginning to where he is now, it's fascinating to see how he sort of morphed and changed as a character. Then you also have other characters like Mo, who really hasn't changed at all. In fact, he's still using the same pike from like level two. Uh, he, he's probably going to use that pike until he dies. And then you have Hiroji, who actually is on a longer journey. He actually is also changing, but I'm not going to go into exactly how and why yet. His changes are going to come around module four, and you're going to see that really appear more uh, in the future, but he also is changing because his big thing is he's also going for the hunt and he wants to learn everything about xenobiology and aliens and things like that. So again, what am I talking about? So back to the original, the original concept of how to change PCs. Changing PCs, what I mean by that is how to make people who play their PCs more open-minded to modifying their characters in ways they might not have expected. That's what I'm really talking about. So there's two ways to do it. There's the overt way, which is you kill them off and modify them for them. And then there's sort of the passive way, which is talking to them when they level up, kind of talk to them about their concepts of their character and how to sort of modify them and then quote point out, which I like to do, uh, point out sort of strange things or strange abilities or modifications that they can make to their PCs. And lo and behold, hey, what do you know? Maybe you should put some gills on your character. That might be cool. Or maybe put some suction cups in your character or maybe some uh, robotic arms or legs or something like that. And again, these 
these are things they might not normally do, but as you as the GM kind of pushing them along, it helps them think, oh, this is being approved by, quote, the GM. Maybe this is a good thing. And obviously, if he's approving it and talking about it, he won't punish me for it, if anything, encourage me to do it. So it's almost like you as the GM don't realize always your power, and you can just say something. It's sort of like you ever have a fight with your boyfriend or girlfriend, and there's like one little thing you shouldn't have said, and it becomes this like big thing. What's well, the same way as like with the GM? It's like if the GM says one little thing, like "Oh, I wouldn't get that," you know. Some people see it as a challenge, but other PCs might say, "Oh, I'm not going to take that feat or that ability because he told me not to." So you know, it's it's again, you might have been saying it in passing and might not think about it. But you got to be very careful as a GM as to what you say because PCs will really take that to heart. And it goes the other way, is that if you encourage them to take things that might be a little outside the box, then, well, that will encourage them to actually do it. Because if you're going out of your way to talk about it and show them these abilities or feats or weird things they might be able to add to their character, then they know they can do it and they won't get punished for it. So that's what I mean of like how to encourage your characters to embrace the weird. Now, finally, one thing is that these characters are their characters, and it doesn't happen a lot, but once in a while I will get pushback, sometimes very hard pushback, from PC saying, no, don't tell me how to make my character or how to play my character, and that's completely legitimate as well. Uh, in fact, I would say Bob is one of those people, is that he either is very open to an idea or very against an idea, and that's just the way he is. I completely respect that. And I always, again, I'm never trying to push him in any direction. I'm really going by, this is okay in my opinion, because there are, and Bob's actually also very respectful for this, I'd say about 1% of the time there are feats and ability, and this is more for Pathfinder than Starfinder, that I will veto, that I feel that are either OP or will just break the game or make you too much of a center of attention. Like, Followers is a very good example in... Uh, D&D or Pathfinder, having followers suddenly gives you two or three characters, and suddenly you have almost as many characters as there is members of the party, and that could be a real detriment to both focus and playing time, and there's a lot of things with that. So, again, when it comes down to it, as a GM, try to encourage the strange, either do it indirectly or directly, do respect your PCs for their vision of the character and also help encourage them to do cool, fun things that are within the big picture of how they envision their character will grow and change. If you do that, you'll have a really fun time. The characters will start growing in really strange and funny ways and you'll have really memorable PCs and most importantly, really memorable adventures. So here we are, show notes once again. So again, don't forget, next week we have Amanda on the show. Again, she's going to play multiple NPCs, and we'll do some more of cool EOX exploration. Also next week, we're going to finally, finally find out what the heck is going on with Rusty and his undead background. Also don't forget, there's a new podcast every Tuesday. Do subscribe to us on iTunes and Android, and do please like us. Do put down reviews, all that fun stuff. We used to do contests where if you left reviews, I'd randomly pull out those reviews and give out prizes. I might have to start doing that again because you guys aren't leaving reviews on iTunes, and it really helps us quite a bit. Please do. Also, check out Jason's Talking Combat column. It's every single Thursday. Do check out the Discord channel. It's discord.rollforcombat.com got tons of games and people talking and chatting we got a million things going on over there and if you post a lot you do get a free t-shirt that's right always a free t-shirt if you post and get up to level 10 do check us out on twitter facebook youtube check out the reddit channel and do continue to listen to the show. We got something coming up pretty soon. I can't talk about it just yet, but it's going to be coming out really, really soon. It's Starfinder related, and you guys are going to like it. I promise you. Anyhow, with that, I will talk to you and see you guys next week. See ya. 
You've been listening to Roll for Combat, a Starfinder actual play podcast. If you have a question or comment for the show, please visit us at rollforcombat.com or drop us a line at contact at rollforcombat.com. You can also find us on Twitter, Facebook, Discord, and other social media platforms. been listening to Roll for Combat. Until next week, always remember that putting a portable hole inside a handy haversack voids the warranty on both. <laughs>